So if we could start with your full name, please. Okay. My name is Earl Thomas Williams. And where and when were you born? I was born in uh, a little city of Martins Ferry, Ohio, on the 10th of March, 1919. So how old are you today? I'm 99 years old. <laughs> Do you feel 99? No, not really. No. And which branch of the, the military did you serve with? Uh, I went into the Army Air Corps at that time. So. And what years did you serve from and until? I joined the uh, Army Air Corps on the 23rd of September, 1939. And when did you end your career in the military? On the 1st of October, 1969. So you had a 30-year career. 30. 30 years in a week. <laughs> and you served through Korea and Vietnam. Uh, uh, well, I was in the service during those periods, yes. yes but I did go overseas in uh, Korea or Vietnam. Okay, great. And what was the highest rank that you attained? Colonel. Colonel. And speaking in regards to World War II, did you receive any medals for your service? I have, well, uh, I've got the Distinguished Flying Cross and uh, a lot of uh, service medals and uh, meritorious uh, achievement medal at, at retirement. And what what was your job in the Army Air Corps? Well, I'm I was an aircraft maintenance officer f for a good portion of my career, and then I switched to missiles, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um. So did you do groundwork or did you fly? Uh, I, I was never a rated officer, never became a pilot or anything. So it was all ground, ground work and uh, mostly headquarters work. I was in headquarters most of my career. So, and commanding officers of two or three squadrons in the beat time, so. I know you had one pretty uh, memorable flight early on in your career. Yes, yes. Um, that was aboard one of the, the B-17s that was flying B into... B-17s. Okay. Yes. And that was flying into Hickam Field? That is correct. Okay. And did you fly any other missions during World y War II? Yes, I flew 55 missions in the Pacific Theater during that next period. And were those uh, bombing missions or an um, array of... Uh, we had bombing missions, but most of them were reconnaissance missions. I was in a reconnaissance squadron, but we did both. Great. So, uh, rewinding a little bit, talking about growing up uh, in Ohio, your childhood. Tell me about your, your parents. Who were they? Well, uh, uh, my parents were... Uh, in business, uh, at one time, they owned uh, uh, the largest independent dairy in Martin in uh, the Ohio Valley at that time. But uh, during the Depression, uh, that was sort of became tenuous, and uh, so a big uh, name uh, dairy came in and. Uh, took over the whole area and so they had to disband their uh, independent dairy. And so they went in the business of uh, like a 7-Eleven store mm -hmm. and uh, made home ice cream and we sold all the, the, the sundry bread and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my dad uh, eventually uh, had ran for uh, Justice of the Peace, and he was Justice of the Peace there in uh, my hometown for 18 years. So, and uh, so uh, we sold the business later on, and 
I was working, I went to work for a bakery. So I went to work for the bakery while I was in high school, part time. So after high school, I went there full time as a, just doing all sorts of things uh, that you do in a bakery. A little, it used to be a, a well, it was and still is, I guess, uh, where they deliver, it's a house, you know, they, you call and, and they would deliver the breads and everything like that. We've used to load their trucks up and so forth like that. But anyhow, I, I left there and uh, decided that uh, there's no great opportunities in Martin's Ferry. It was an iron and steel city and uh, there were no jobs during the Depression. But I was lucky to be able to work in this bakery after high school. Did you and, have any uh, siblings? I had one brother. I had one brother. Older or younger? He was two years older and he passed away in 1990. Okay. So, Did he serve uh, during the war as well? And he was in the service for a very short time. He was a father of three children, so they left him out early. So, But he was in the Army ar Arsenal. Uh, I guess that's what part of the service he was in. Uh, not very, uh, not very long. So, Great. and were you guys close growing up? Have what? Were you guys close? You and your brother yes, and your family. Yes. Yes. You guys were pretty. We were very group. active in scouting, and both of us became Eagle Scouts during that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to point out that uh, while we had that store. Uh, from the time that we were able to uh, make cash at the cash register and wait on customers, uh, we would uh, wait on the trade in the stores from the time we got out of school until about nine o'clock at night where my mother would come on and take on and we were open till 11 o'clock. You know, she, she would take that period. But he would take it one night, I would take it the next night to do that, you know. What age were you? What age were you while you were doing this? What was that? How old were you at that time? Uh, 15, 16 years old, or maybe a little young, younger than that. So you'd go to school, and then you'd go to work? We'd come home from, from school, and uh, we would just sit in there, do our homework and everything. We waited on trade, you know, from time we got out of school until uh, about nine o'clock at night my mother would take over then. But uh, uh, it was it, it was just a learning curve for both of us to know how to to uh, do a little business and everything. So but uh, it it took a lot of our time. Uh, did you guys help out on the dairy farm when your father had that? No. No, that was a little bit before us, uh, where we were too young for that. So, But uh, we did help out. Uh, we made, my dad made it, homemade ice cream. Mm -hmm. And so we would uh, be out there to, to lick the paddle off the thing when it pulled it out of the churner. So. Were you guys the, the taste testers? What was that? You're, were you the official taste tester? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you, when they were used to make ice cream, it used to be in a big uh, ice barrel and everything. Then they pull the paddle out. My dad would scrape off all the ice cream. Then what was left? They would give it to my brother, I, and our friends <laughs> to finish off. So. <laughs> Uh, so did you have any other jobs as, as a young man uh, growing up or were you mainly helping out at the family store? Well, no. Uh, uh, my brother and I used to uh, have a little uh, cart and we would go out and uh, we would haul ashes. People used to have furnaces in those days and had a lot of ash. So we would go and uh, we would uh, get a job of cleaning up the ash and take it to the city dump 
in that cart. And uh, used to get about 25 cents for that one, so, you know, so. Uh, but anyhow, we did little haul jobs and things like that. My brother was very, very crafted in making things. He would make little automobiles for us. We had little gas engines on them, everything like that. And uh, uh, just everything. We, like when we were in the Boy Scouts, we made all of our own utensils and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything, we never went out to buy anything. Our parents didn't have that that uh, amount of money to go out and do things like that during the Depression, so. So the, you said you'd get about 25 cents for hauling ash? Yeah. Who, would you get paid from the, the people that you'd, the residents that you would take the ash from? Or? Yeah, from the residents, they would give us 25 cents to clean out their furnace and haul the ashes away, so. And would you give that money to your parents? No, or we would kept you be that. Able to keep that. That was for us, so. We never had an allowance or anything like that, so we had to make our own way. And how? what age were you at that point? Um, well, that was before we got, we were in about 12, 13, 14 years old. Okay. And um, did you play any sports growing up? I, my brother was in a, on the high school football team for a short period, but I never did. And did you graduate high school? Both of us. My brother uh, uh, was late getting into school and uh, we both went through high school in, uh, at the same time. So okay. we both graduated on the same day, time. Was that uh, 37, 38? 37. So there was about a two year gap between when you graduated high school and when you joined the military. Yeah, I joined the military when I was 20. So, so what did you do during that time? Well, I was working in the, uh, the bakery, as I said, between, okay. between high school and time I got in the service. Okay. Yeah, I, I just worked. And uh, uh, I did, I did I, we were very active. We did all sorts of things, you know, uh, building things and model airplanes and things like that, you know. And even airplanes that we would try to fly, you know, just just r r makers, you know, you know, something, you know, you make out of nothing, you know. So. But anyhow, we just kept busy. And uh, I decided that, uh, as I said before, there was no opportunity at that time because we were still in the Deep Depression. Yeah. And uh, just towards the end of it. And uh, there was no no work in the steel mills or anything like that. They were all shutting down. So we just made do what we could. So did you always have an affinity for flying before joining the? Yeah, I used to uh, go to the local airport whenever I had uh, could accumulate $2. Used to be $2 for a little flight just to get up go around the city, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I went, did that two or three times. I, uh, a little Lockheed airplane, and then uh, and uh, one time in a, the old Ford tri-motor plane, so. But anyhow, I had an uncle who was in the uh, Army Air Corps, and he was Master Sergeant uh, stationed at Langley Field, Virginia. And uh, I, he was one of my favorite uncles and he would come and visit us all the time. And so we went down to Langley Field uh, to uh, see what he was doing and everything. And uh, the airplanes at that time was the old B-2 uh, aircraft. And an episode that happened during that time, uh, uh, Sergeants were sometimes co-pilots and sometimes pilots on those those aircraft. And uh, anyhow, uh, he had an opportunity to come in. Uh, well, he's, they were supposed to go to uh, Columbus, Ohio, 
and picked up a captain who had broken his leg and taken him back to Langley. Well, my uncle says, well, we're going to fly over my hometown. How about letting me off there and then come back and pick me up? They said, okay. So they did. They flew into a little town called Yorkville, which is just north of my town. Let him off, and he stayed there with his my mother, his sister, and his, another sister. And uh, so when they came back to pick him up, got in the airplane, and we were all out there to see him taking off and everything. And they took off, and they crashed right at the end of the runway. Hit, went on a railroad track, took out a couple telephone poles and everything in that airplane. It didn't catch fire, and they all survived the, the crash. So <laughs> they lost an engine on takeoff. So anyhow, so and that was an episode that I watched. To, and you can imagine what my mother and uh, her, her sister were. That was very traumatic I, experience there. I could imagine. But, but they all got out with just minor injuries and everything. So. And that didn't deter you from wanting no, to? No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I still had the inkling for aircraft, so. <laughs> all right. So talk to me about um, your choice uh, joining joining the military. You, you mentioned there was there wasn't okay. much job opportunity in, in Ohio. Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, there was no opportunity there. I, I could sense that, you know, right after I got out of high school, and so I got a letter from uh, uh, the Army Air Corps and trying to entice people to enlist. And uh, they promised to send me to aircraft mechanic school if I enlisted. And uh, I thought, geez, that's a good, good opportunity to see, see the world and everything. So anyhow, uh, I decided to do that. And uh, to tell you how times were, I had to borrow $15 from my father to get a bus ticket to go to Rantoul, Illinois and join the Army Air Corps, so, <laughs> and that's where, but they did, they sent me through uh, aircraft mechanic school, mm -hmm. and uh, after that, they gave me a choice of uh, three bases to be assigned to. It was Selfridge Field at that time, uh, Langley Field, Virginia, and March, and they, they decided to send me to March Air Base at that time. Put me on a train, and I ended up here at March on April 1940. I was assigned to the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron here at March. Thacker was part of that outfit at that time. Okay. Do you know, did you guys go through uh, together, through training together? Uh, yeah. uh, no. He was a, he was already a pilot and one of the aircraft that was assigned to the aircraft. I was just assigned as an aircraft mechanic, okay. you know. Okay. So talk to me about your your first uh, first days and weeks at, at March. Uh, what was that experience like for you getting out of Ohio and, and oh, California? Oh, I when I got off the train, I saw this beautiful city of Riverside has changed so much since then. And uh, just a beautiful little city. And uh, I, one of the things that I noted, uh, you could see orange juice uh, uh, little stands on corners, you know, selling orange juice and things like that. But anyhow, I, I got off the, the train at the Santa Fe station in, in the Riverside, caught a bus out a military bus that came, took me out to march. So, and anyhow, uh, I thought, Jesus, this is uh, this is paradise, you know. Mm -hmm. I loved the, I loved the uh, base out here, and everything else, and uh, so I loved the assignment. So I I I was a Californian from that time on. <laughs> Nowadays. Maybe I ought to leave, it's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed a little bit. 
So how, how long did you spend at, at March? Uh, I was there for uh, from uh, April of 40 to about June, I think, of 41 when the outfit moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. It was a new base there, just starting up. In fact, it hadn't even been open by the time we arrived. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that spent the rest of my time in the States at that time, mm -hmm. there at Albuquerque. And they're, they're teaching you about uh, airplane maintenance and mechanics? Yes, I, uh, I was an aircraft mechanic here at March and everything. And in those days, we had two grades. Uh, I, uh, my experience going through school and everything, and I took an examination and they made me a second class air mechanic. I went from $21 to $64 a month and uh, still a private. But then while I was uh, at Albuquerque, I was promoted to sergeant. I was never a corporal from, from uh, private first class to uh, a buck sergeant. And my, I was uh, made a first class air mechanic and gave me $84 a month. So I was in heaven. So. <laughs> quite the quite the pay raise there. Yeah. Now, uh, what type of planes were you working on? Did well, they teach you general aviation? Yeah. Or? Well, at March, uh, we had a conglomeration of uh, aircraft, uh, B-18s, uh, eight uh, attack airplanes, uh, uh, transport airplane. It wasn't until we were able to get B-17, and so we were able to get the first B-17As. Uh, the United States bought uh, a whole group of uh, B-17As, and they made uh, uh, a big uh, flight to South America and everything like that. So they were, they sent those airplanes after they were finished with that to our squadron, 17A. They came in very, very, very poor condition and everything. And when you use the old term, putting together with uh, wire, you know, safety wire, well, they were, they were. So our job was to straighten them up, clean them up, paint them, make sure they were all in perfect shape and everything like that. So we worked on those B-17 days until they start sending in new B-17 Bs mm -hmm. at that time. So that's what we had when we, well, we had 17 days when we went to Albuquerque and that's where we exchanged to the newer B-17s. Okay. Um. And at that time I was made the assistant crew chief on a B-17. B. And this is still peacetime. Uh, did you have any inclination that, that you would eventually end up, um, that America would eventually end up at war? No, had no. We knew that the uh, winds of war were all around us because of the, the war in overseas. So we knew that we were going to be in some sort of a part of it in a way. But as uh, far as what w happened at Pearl Harbor, we had no inclination whatsoever that anything like that was going to happen. So, And looking back now, um, do you think that that invitation, the, the recruitment for you to join the Army Air Corps, do you think that was the government's uh, sort of way to start preparing? Yes. Okay. Well, they were so unprepared. You know, and yeah. so they started from almost from scratch, yeah. you know, and that extended through my first year in the combat and everything. We had, to, well, I could go into that later, but, but uh, no, we were not prepared for war. Right. Um, so you guys are in, in New Mexico and um, 
towards the end of uh, well, how long are you guys in, in New Mexico for? Well, and then take, uh, me, take me through the progression yeah. until leading up to uh, you know the end of forty one. Uh, we were there until the 6th of uh, December, 1941. Okay. That's when we got orders to get out. So, so what orders did you receive? What was that? What were the orders that you received? Well, uh, uh, we were told to prepare for a movement to the Philippines to augment the, the forces there. And so at that time, we didn't know exactly what it was all about because being uh, a lowly airman, you know, they didn't tell you everything. So, but we were instructed to, in those days, we had to build boxes. We got lumber and everything, build boxes to, to box up all of our equipment, you know, and everything to take to the Philippines with us. So we were engaged in that for about a month before that we had to leave, but I was selected to be on the uh, the air uh, crews that were going over, and uh, most of the squadron were sent by boat. But uh, uh, so let me ask you real quick: Did you have any any prior flight training? Uh, I know a lot of the work that you did was was ground work. You said but... well, while I was uh, I was assistant crew chief there in Albuquerque, and. Uh, I used to take many flights, you know, going along. They had to have mechanic on board, you know. So we flew probably four or five times a week, you know, just training flights for everybody. So I would be on most of those, you know. My crew chief was an older man. He came from the old service, and he was a master sergeant. And uh, he elected not to go on these flights, and so I would, I would be happy to go. You know, we go fly it around. So. So you were selected uh, to fly. Yeah. Uh, so you guys left New Mexico, and. Well, we got, we as I said, uh, we were on the, uh, I was on the air. Uh, part of the movement to the Philippines. And we got our orders to depart on the 6th, 6th of the, uh, December to fly into Hamilton Air Base in California. And from there we would go to our first stop in the Philippines on our way to the Philippines. We were part of the 12 B-17s, uh, six from our squadron and six from the uh, 88th Squadron out of Salt Lake City. And uh, we departed uh, Hamilton Field on the night of December the 6th. And correct me if I'm wrong, but did the, the six that left uh, Salt Lake City, did they meet up with you guys in California? And, and was it all, did you guys all take off? Uh, I don't know where they, we launched from Hamilton, but I don't know where they launched from. I wasn't sure, but. <clears throat> they were probably there, but okay. we didn't we didn't work together too well. They were separate, you know. Okay. <clears throat> but you guys essentially arrived at the same time, yeah. more or less. Well, they arrived later, for it, so they must have been on the tail end okay. of coming in. Okay. Uh, we were the first ones to take off. Okay. My pilot was uh, uh, a captain at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, or wait a minute excuse me, a major at the time, not my pilot, but the squadron commander was a major, uh, Truman H. Landon, and uh, my pilot was a captain, so we were next in line to take off. Mm -hmm. So we came in, uh, we had a B-17C. It was, the, the commander got the new B-17Es and had the turrets on, tail guns, and all that sort of stuff, so it was a little slower. We had a B-17C. We had no no tail gun. We had no turrets or anything like that. We just had a little bathtub on, underneath. So apparently, from my perspective, we were the first to arrive there <clears throat> just a little bit before, because uh, we, ha we saw nobody in front of us or anything like that. So we, when we arrived, we were in the pattern 
the flight uh, pattern to land at uh, Hickam. So you guys had no guns, no, no way to guns. defend yourself. We had guns, but no ammunition. Okay, no ammunition. And these these are brand new brand new airplanes that, that you guys are taking over. Uh, well, uh, the squadron commander had a brand new one, okay. but we had a, a, a B seventeen C, which was an older model. But uh, it had it's no no tail gunner. No, we, we had some side gunners, no uh, guns up front that I can remember. But anyhow, it was just very, very little, you know. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong again, but uh, I understand that one of the planes, one of the B-17s had to turn back at some point. I don't know if they were in your squadron or the other. We the had other. one airplane that had engine trouble. It didn't come. So did they even take off? Or yes, they... they came off later. Okay. They came after the fact, you know, after the the uh, December the seventh. After the ordeal. Event. Okay. Um, so you spent very little time in in uh, in California. You landed on the sixth and took off the e the evening of the sixth as well. On the yes. Well, we came in and all uh, they. Uh, had us in and uh, at for for dinner at the mess hall, and I had to go to the line and gas up the airplane. I wanted to make sure that we had to top off because it was right at that took everything that we had to get there. That was a twelve hour flight or fourteen hour flight to get to Hawaii. So I my job was to make it all the all the gas tanks were all topped off and everything like that. And so they had a meeting of the crews, but I was on the flight line gassing up, and so I missed that meeting. We had a, a general officer there by the name of Fickle, and he told everybody that uh, somebody asked, says, well, we don't have any ammunition aboard. He was telling them that we may r encounter some uh, enemy action on the way. And he said, well, you won't need it until you, you get to Hawaii, you know. Uh, so we didn't, we, but we didn't have it. So yeah. he was, he, yeah, was so. he was right about that. Um, so had you been on a flight that long before? Would that would that be the longest flight? That was the longest. Yeah. Okay. And what time did you guys take off? Um, I had some times in my. What's we got? Uh, I th uh, the uh, squadron commander took off at nine o'clock at night, and uh, we we took off probably fifteen minutes or ten minutes later, you know, yeah. right after that. So, okay. um, and and for the most part, was the flight uneventful? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was noisy, mm -hmm. as the B seventeen was, you know, and. Uh, but the, nothing, uh, it was just long during yeah. flight over there, so. so do, you, do you take naps? Do you, what yeah. do you do to pass the yeah. time? Yeah, and they gave us, uh, <clears throat> all I remember was we, as before we left, they, I said, they gave us, uh, took us to the mess hall and gave us dinner. But I don't remember them ever packing any in-flight uh, lunch or anything like that. But they did give us two, the, the airplane was always equipped with two gallon uh, thermos for coffee. So we had coffee aboard, but I don't ever remember any food, you know, and because I remember we were hungry that next day trying to find something to eat. Imagine. So, but I don't remember them ever having a, an inboard flight. Just Sleeping, just waiting. Yeah. We weren't looking for anybody or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Had no idea what was to come. No. Um, and were you excited about going to Hawaii and uh, overseas? And in a way, in a way. We had a flight surgeon aboard. Uh -huh. uh, he was not a member of our crew, but uh, we were taking him to the Philippines to be the flight surgeon for our unit. And uh, as we approached the Hawaiian Islands, just a sunrise, uh, 
I was up in the cockpit right in back of him. He was, uh, the, the B-17C had uh, a little observer seat right in back of the co-pilot and a little dome and escape hatch above him. But anyhow, uh, uh, he saw Diamond Head and uh, the sun coming up. And so he was so excited about the trip and everything. So he turned to me and he said, you know, I wouldn't take a million dollars for this trip. I said, well, it is. It is a beautiful sight coming in, you know. So anyhow, we were going in for our approach to, to Hickam, looking at the uh, Royal Hawaii Hotel and Waikiki Boots and all that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden, the uh, I was looking out the side, I was in the radio compartment looking out the side window with the radio operator and the system radio operator and uh, all of a sudden the plastic canopy over the twin 50s we had in the radio compartment exploded and went just out. I thought, this shattered. I thought, what the devil was that, you know? So I stood up and looked out. I saw this, well, f first of all, we saw, as we were looking out, we saw three fighter airplanes going under our right wing in the opposite direction. Well, the radio operator had been to, he ferried a B-17 to Hawaii in May of, of 41. So he said, oh, the Navy always sends up some fighter airplanes to escort us in when we come from the States. So that's what it, my assumption was. So I looked out and this fighter plane was right on her to one of them, right on, and it was so close that I could see the pilot in the cockpit. Well, it was fireworks coming in the radio compartment, and uh, we had soundproofing. It had uh, cotton batting in. So many of those bullets were coming through there, and that cotton batting was floating in the the radio compartment were like snowflakes and everything. But I knew that we had installed armor plate on the back side of the radio compartment while we were at Albuquerque. And I thought, my God, I, I stood down back, stuck down behind that, you know, what's my God. And uh, the uh, radio operator and the radio, uh, this radio operator, they decided to get out of the the radio compartment. Well, anyhow, then all of a sudden they hit a radar. We used to carry pyrotechnic flares in the radio compartment for signaling purposes, all lined up on the right side of the radio compartment. Anyhow, they hit those pyrotechnic flares and the whole radio compartment burst into a ball of fire. Just, so I, had to get out of there real quick like. I remember trying to pick up my parachute for some reason. It was all on fire and everything was sitting there. So I went out into the Bombay, closed the door, and the fire come over and set my hair on fire. And I went through the the Bombay into the radio into the cockpit to tell the pilot what was happening. Well that by that time smoke started to come into the cockpit. You know, and he had, if I remember correctly, distinctly, he had opened up the side window mm -hmm. to try to, to make uh, that some of that smoke go out and everything like that, so he could see the instruments and everything. And he did a beautiful job in trying to get that airplane on the ground. But uh, he did and uh, got touched down and everything as we were rolling down the runway while well, the airplane broke apart right where the fire was in the radio compartment. So we skidded to a stop by the hangar line. And uh, I'm gonna ask you, uh, just before we continue on with, with what happened after you guys touched the ground, um, when did you realize, I know this, that that they weren't friendly 
uh, enemy fighters and that you guys were under attack and, and when did it when did it all sort of make sense what was happening or did it well I don't think I realized that until we were on the ground you know there's something was happening because they were still strafing us see as even though the airplane was stopped and everything and just half of it there they were still strafing us you know so it was that time that I knew that we had some action yeah. against us, you know. I, and how long was it um, once you guys were first under attack until you guys landed? How long were you guys taking fire? Very shortly, in fact, if it lasted a, just a few. I would estimate if it lasted, if we were able to stay in the air, Four more, five more minutes, we would, the airplane would descend. We wouldn't be here today to talk about it, you know. It's just, it's just, got, it was very short. Yeah. The pilot was, it was bound to determine to get it on the ground as quickly as possible. In fact, the co-pilot didn't understand what was going on and he was pulled up the landing gear, started pulling up the landing gear to go around. Well, we didn't have any fuel, we hadn't left anyhow. So anyhow, the pilot said, get, that, get those wheels down real quick, mm -hmm. you know, so we'd get on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and at first, when all this happened, he had expressed to the co-pilot that all that smoke over in Pearl Harbor, he says, that's sugar cane. They burned sugar cane over here. Cause, so that indicates we had no idea what was going on. He had no message to him or anything like that so he was unaware of what the hell was going on so and do you know what that smoke was now yeah we knew that uh, later on you know so what was going after that but uh no the uh the flight surgeon before we got out of the airplane when the aircraft stopped stopped the, I noticed that the flight surgeon had been hit. He, I didn't know where, but he had blood on him, you know. And these shells were coming in the back of the uh, armor plate. We had put real heavy-duty armor plate back of the pilot and co-pilot in Albuquerque. And the, the armor plate for the pilot and co-pilot was about a quarter of an inch thick. It was big or, or more. It was heavy. And so these things were coming in and ricocheting off the back of the, the, the co-pilot and the pilot. And hadn't been for that, we would never have made it because that would have been, they would have been killed, you know, right there in the cockpit, so. And you were behind that. I was well. right back of that. That's, that's when I noticed that I, I must have been hit. I, I got scraped in the head, it was a scalp wound, and uh, the, Blood start start tasting blood in my mouth, you know, so it started trickled out and everything like that. But the, the uh, flight surgeon says, "Well, how do you get out of this airplane?" I says, "Well, there's two ways: out of the top escape hatch, or down through the entrance door." He says, "I'm going to go down to the entrance door." I said, "I'll follow you. I'll be right back of you." So he went down, and I went right after him. Well. As I said, they were still strafing us. So I decided, I'm going to stay here at the thickest part of this airplane, you know. I'm not going to run out there. So the landing gear, I huddled by the landing gear. Well, unfortunately, he went towards the hangar line and he was hit by a uh, ricochet bullet in, in the head and was killed. So, so that's up to that point, that's where we were. So you got you got grazed by one of the yeah. one of the bullets that, that yeah. came in. Um, <clears throat> now you mentioned the the plane was filling with smoke. Was it hard to breathe? Hard to see? In the cockpit, it was. It got to be black smoke, you know, everything like that. And it was, it was pretty uh, pretty dense, you know. But as I said, the pilot uh, had that lip window open. Yeah. You know, he was trying to. Trying to get some of it out. So. Did you guys have any communication with with the radio tower? No. Okay. 
And uh, the other the other five or well, other four. Uh, let me take that back. Sure. If they did, it was about landing instructions or something like that. But but I never heard anybody speak about any. Every it was in a like, we were in a chaos yeah. situation. You know, I don't think they received anything at all from the tower. And the the other B seventeens that were in in your group. Um, were they you guys went, the first ones on the ground, or they went on uh, landed up land, wheels up on golf courses. And they just tried to get because they had no fuel t to go anyplace else. And right. they landed wherever they could. Okay. So you guys were the only ones that that actually landed yeah. on, on the runway there. And um, okay, so now you now you guys are on the ground. Uh, your your plane broke in half. Yes. Um, Shortly after you, after the plane landed, as we were rolling down the the runway and everything, and <clears throat> so it just broke in half, and uh, their front part skidded towards the hangar line. See? So, like you said, if you had been in the air any longer, oh yeah, that was just minutes, yeah, yeah. Um, because it was a fierce fire. I mean, it was you take pyrotechnic fire. Not only did they hit one, but all of them went. See. It's just, a, it's an inferno. And how many men are on board? Somebody keep asking me, I, I say nine or 10. <laughs> I had to start counting them up. We had a, we had a bombardier, we had a, a navigator, we had a pilot and co-pilot, we had a, a crew chief, uh, an assistant crew chief, me, we had a radio operator, an assistant radio operator, mm -hmm. and the flight surgeon, so we were nine. Mm -hmm. Great. So once you guys land on the ground, you're, you're huddled um, underneath the plane by the I landing was. gear? Yeah, and until, the, until the strafing stopped. So you and see, at that time, when I was under there, I could see where they were coming down strafing parked aircraft in the field and everything. And I witnessed this one airplane, he came down so low, this fighter plane, so low, too low, and his propeller hit the, hit the dirt because a big cloud of dust and everything went down. But first of all, he knocked off the auxiliary fuel tank and it went up back in the airplane. And then the propeller was digging in the dirt and everything, but he pulled up like that. Then he went right down in the, they said it was over in Camp Fort Cam, wherever he crashed, landed over there. And in the process, as I understand, I heard this story from people who were there, that two people were killed when he crashed there over there. Yeah, that, that's, I don't know for sure whether that's exactly right or not, but that's right. But I witnessed that guy, he just got too low but they were coming down so low, I don't know how they missed the telephone wires and everything, strafing, you know. And I imagine it's just chaos. All over, all over. And was it, was it uh, the pilot that you mentioned he ran out and got strafed? Who, which, which? Uh, no, the, the flight surgeon. The flight surgeon. He was killed there. So you saw him get uh, get gunned I, down. I didn't see him get hit or anything because okay. I was huddled down, but that's where he got hit. Okay, so you're and waiting. He didn't die on the spot. Mm -hmm. He got hit in the head and they came and took him to the hospital. He died in the hospital. So how long were you huddled under there until you made, made a run? Well, I stayed there for a little while until I could see that that the enemy was sort of backing off and they were going in doing other things. You Are you know. by yourself at this point? Oh. I was at that time. The uh, two radio operators, they were in the back seat of that. They were in that part that broke off, see. Mm -hmm. I was in the forward section, see. So. Uh, and then and then, where did you go? When did you, well, when did you make a run? The, uh, the, uh, the navigator, the co-pilot and navigator, well, uh, the bombardier got hit so badly, he was uh, hit in the knee of the, 
and uh, I, I never saw him take him out of the airplane, but, but he was severely injured. Uh, uh, the uh, navigator got hit in the, the ear and is bleeding. I don't know whether you ever get a neck in the ear, that's, it bleeds pretty f profusively. And uh, myself with blood running down. But the co-pilot uh, decided to take us to the hospital. And we went up th through trying to find out where the hospital was. And I remember going through one of the uh, barracks kitchen, finding out we found a cook there. Said, told us where the hospital was. But people in those der uh, barracks were going out into the prairie ground, open prairie ground, setting up uh, machine gun bases. That's where a lot of them got hit and killed there because it was out in open spaces. They were still being strafed. But anyhow, we did find the hospital got up there. And so uh, they said that since we were part of an air crew, they want to give us priority treatment to get back to going after the enemy, you know. So they did. They t treated me fairly quickly. Just, they shaved hair off my wound and put a, gave me a, 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 what's my cut? Shot. Yeah. Tetanus shot? Tetanus shot. And uh, wrote T, I, T, A, T on my forehead in the, uh, a red uh, antiseptic, you know. So, <laughs> but the officer, they went in a different direction. See, so I was left alone there to go back. And, uh, but before I got a little thing here, going into the hospital, the dead and wounded were laying on cots on the hospital lawn out front. Some of them were severely wounded everything. You could tell that they weren't going to last very long. There must have been maybe 10 or 12 or maybe more. Just they didn't have a way to get them in there. That's, that's very vivid in my mind watching these kids. It's a quick shot. Anyhow, after I got my wound dressed, I went started back towards the flight line. And as I got by the barracks, I looked up and here the Japanese bombers were coming over and they just dropped their bombs on the barracks. I could see they released their bombs and I thought, I got to get out of here. So I ran further towards the flight line. And I thought the best place to go is into one of the hangars. Well, I went into one hangar and uh, it had been converted to uh, to uh, athletics. They had a boxing ring in there and other things like that. So it wasn't used for aircraft maintenance. But I thought that was a good safe place to get away from this thing. But they were still strafing that hangar. It was coming through the tile roof and ricocheting off of the off of the floor of the hangar all over the place. And so I, this is not for me to get it, stay in here. So I went out and I went along the flight line to where uh, some people had gathered, where they had an armory there and went into this hangary. So they took me in and gave me a, a rifle, a belt of ammunition, canteen, all that stuff and a World War I helmet. <laughs> so that's myself and the assistant radio operator by the name of Sergeant Bruce were the only two of us from the crew there. The radio operator was hit during the hip. They hauled him away to the hospital. The crew chief was hit in the shoulder. They hauled him away to the hospital. Uh, the pilot and the co-pilot, neither one, were wounded. So, anyhow, it was just Sergeant Bruce and I standing there. So I had no 
connection to the rest of the crew, yeah. wherever they were or anything else. Mm -hmm. So we set out that day to try to find out where they were mm -hmm. so we could join them. And uh, in the in the uh, attempt to do that, we ran across a captain from the Signal Corps who was trying to put some uh, lines between gun position for communications purposes. You know, the old thing, the, a real wire, they just put a pipe through it, you know, and check it out. So we asked him if he knew where the rest of that, our crew was. He said he didn't know, but he would, if if they would help, if we would help him out stretching wire to these gun positions, he would look into it and see if he could find out where they were. Mm -hmm. Well, we did that for for hours, so running around doing that. Never did hear back from the captain again. So anyhow, we still wonder there. We were. Uh, we were looking for something to eat because we, as I said, we were both hungry when we got there, you know, so that's why I always thought to myself, there were no lunches or anything on the airplane. Let me uh, ask you, as you guys are, are laying wire, um, are you still under attack at this point or have they, no, have no, they ceased? No, no, it was over with, you know, at that time. Okay. Um, and when you received the rifle at, at the armory and everything, um, did you end up using it at all? No, no. I mean, you were pretty, pretty defenseless against <laughs> yeah. fighter planes. You know, that that attack listen, didn't last very long, you know. And so when the bombs came over, that was a second wave, I believe, you know. So anyhow, it all quieted down mm -hmm. the, the, by the time we got our equipment and everything to go out. Okay. And uh, so... Anyhow, we uh, we spent the rest of that afternoon trying to locate where the rest of the crew was. And then they directed us to the command post that was set up in the patio of the base commander's home on base. Mm -hmm. And we stayed there in the command post and stayed there all night long. They couldn't. They, they, they finally fed us there. And... Uh, I slept in the bathtub of the base commander's home that night. <laughs> and next morning they said they were located in the, in the officer's quarter across the street from the officer's club. So Sergeant Bruce and I took off as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. We went down and reported in. So, so all in all, um was it just the flight surgeon that was killed? Killed. He was the only one killed. Everybody, I mean, there was a lot of other wounded, but... And incidentally, that hospital at the Hickam Airborne Base is named after him, Schick Hospital. Oh, is that right? So once uh, everything had, had died down, I, you know, the, the aftermath was still yeah. there. And did you have time or a moment to sit and reflect about what had happened that day? Uh, well, at the command post, we were just sitting there. Uh, they were all, all the officers, uh, the commander, they were all busy and everything. So we were just none participants in any of that. Yeah. We were there. They were trying to locate our crew in forest, you know, in, in addition to what they were trying to do. So we didn't really participate in anything there except we had to stay overnight. And everybody was trying to find a place to sleep as they, best they could. And that's, I picked the bathtub, so. Uh, <laughs> so did you do uh, some reflection on, on what you had experienced that day and, and how close you came to? Uh, yeah, it, you know, was still fuzzy with this, you know, what was really going on, you know, because uh, I remember uh, uh, people were in a, a state of disbelief. I think that's what it was, you know. 
they were just doing the best they could. It was become, uh, it become positively that we were at war at that time. And so that everybody was trying to get orders and do whatever they could. They wanted to protect. They didn't know whether it, they had a fleet of people coming in, you know, landing there. You know, that was always a, a possibility and everything. They were guarding against that. Uh, it was just, invasion. it was just, uh, it, it was just chaos, you might say, all over the place, you know. Yeah. And you don't know whether another attack's coming or, or we amphibious didn't know. evasion? We or, didn't know. And, okay, so, um, you mentioned that black smoke earlier that you thought was, you guys talked about being the sugar kings. I understand that was, that was We didn't know that it was Pearl Harbor, so. Yeah, but, it, but. Now knowing everything, uh, I understand that was that was probably the yeah. Arizona. Yeah, we were hearing about the uh, the uh, damage that was being done over there. Mm -hmm. We were made aware of that. So, had you ever made your way over there? Yes, I did. How how soon afterwards? Uh, it was about oh, three or four days mm -hmm. later. I went over, and they had. Uh, uh, two uh, destroyers in dry docked at the time. The casing, well, I used to know it. Two destroyers in the casings in the downs were two destroyers. They flooded the, they flooded the uh, dry dock to keep the fire off the vessels. And uh, that oil, that old thick oil, was all over outside everything. So you went over there, had to walk through that stuff, this that gooey crap, you know. But anyhow, we got to get over there and see all the damage. They wouldn't let anybody in there for a while, you know. So I was able to get there, but uh, got pictures of those two destroyers there. They were able to, as I understand, able to get both of those repaired and everything later, but but anyhow, mm -hmm. that gooey stuff was all over the dock there, so mm -hmm. that, that was something I remember very vividly, so. Now, when you woke up on December 8th, um, and the president makes his announcement that, you know, we're at war with, yeah. with Japan, um, did you hear that? Did you hear that announcement? Did you hear that speech? No, did you... I did. No, did you just heard that? about it. Okay. Just heard about it. So the I guess in the uh, the following days, were you, you were awaiting orders or what, tell me take me well, through what happened. <clears throat> Our crew, we had to wait because we had uh, we had the uh, uh, bombardier the uh, navigator, the crew chief, and the radio operator in the hospital being treated. So we had to wait till we, they could get out, we could, and to get an airplane, because our airplane was gone. So they didn't reassign you to a different crew, you, they, yeah. they kept so you guys anyhow, together? Anyhow, we stayed there uh -huh. for, the time I don't remember just exactly how long it was probably about two weeks that we just trying to get ourselves reorganized and everything and uh, moving to other quarters on the base and uh, being on the alert every minute they were afraid of gas attacks and so we had gas alarms all the time maybe at night and some of the some of the guys that were in their barracks, they would be out and get a little bit too much to drink, and they would come ring the. It was a little triangle, what's yeah. about like a gas tank. You're supposed to get out and put your gas mask on, all right. So that was a problem too, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, we stayed there until we were able to form the crew again. And then we started to fly search missions from there. We would go out 12, 12 hours on 12-hour 12 flights. We would go out, 
this way and back this way and back to the base. So we, we did that almost continually, you know, from that time. Are these I, training flights or are you, you actually searching for submarines or anything, anything? Any enemy vessels or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We had one crew go down, lost navigation because that was the way they had the navigation period. It was a little difficult and everything. And you fly until you're almost out of fuel anyhow. So There's not a lot of room for error. No, not a lot of room for what's we call it. But they uh, they all got out of it. They survived. They were there for four or five days, I think, before they found them. Out in the ocean. Out in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, no, I a little period there. I as I said, I was just a mechanic, assistant crew chief. But then a day or so later, they gave me four hours training on a fifty caliber machine gun and made me a tail gunner. I was never a member of a combat crew then, as a tail gunner. So that's a position I flew for the first, all the way down to Australia and uh, for the first uh, month or so. And then I became a flight engineer, so. And uh, so what are your duties as a flight engineer? Uh, well, first of all, it was just a, a walk around to make sure that your aircraft was, you didn't need anything, make sure it was fueled properly, and uh, did a little pre-flight check on the airplane. And then you manned the upper turret, and uh, you uh, aided the pilot, the co-pilot, whatever they wanted, you know, for maybe maps or something like that, you know just an assistant there, while, but you still had to stay up uh, in the, uh, during our combat mission, stay up in that upper turret. It was a little difficult getting out of there with an oxygen mask on and everything. So most of the time you just stayed there during the, during the mission, you know, so. And uh, is that a 50 caliber machine on the top turret the, as well? The turret, the upper turret, was Twin fifties. Twin fifties. All right. Um, so, can you talk about some of the some of the missions that you flew? You flew mainly out of Australia. Yeah. Well, we would uh, we would fly out of Australia to Port Moresby, New Guinea. Mm -hmm. We would go up there for a whole week, and we fly every day, going out and everything for seven days. And then at the end of the week, we would go back to Townsville, and another crew would go on up there and fly those missions. So it was nip and tuck going back. It wasn't, it wasn't so uh, even all the time because a lot of crews couldn't make it and we would stay longer or, you know, we had to, we, we had to depend on the Royal Australian Air Force. We had nothing there. We had to pay, uh, depend on the Royal Australian Air Force for fuel, for, for, uh, uh, bear, for sleeping accommodations, for, for uh, feeding us, for clothing us, everything that, that the uh, base would have to provide crews and everything. Because Japan had pretty much full control over the, the All Pacific. Because the, the American, uh, Air Force wasn't there. We, we were, we were fully dependent on the Royal Australian Air Force. They had, I had no clothes but a pair of coveralls, and they had to issue me all uh, Australian flying clothes. I had flying boots, uh, short sleeves, khaki short sleeves, sleeve and shorts because that was summer, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, jungle knives. Which I, all this, which I've given to the museum out here, and uh, we would have to eat in the Royal Stadium mess. And as you know, they were famous for for lamb, and they would have uh, uh, lamb for 
cold <laughs> for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So anyhow, that got to be pretty, pretty. What we got until we were able to to establish our own mess there. So, but in the meantime, they they built some quarters for us there, temporary quarters. And, and wow, we slept in tents. And we were there in, uh, in the tents for, oh, maybe two months or three months before they gave quarters for us. Mm -hmm. and you uh, my first mission was uh, on the 23rd of February, 1942. Mm -hmm. We were flying to Verbal and uh, take over Rebol there. Bomb Rebol. Not, not take it over, I'm sorry. Just to bomb it. Anyhow, uh, there were only 12 B-17s in uh, Australia at the time. By the time, one of them ran in, uh, had a ground accident with an airliner, so he couldn't make it down in Brisbane. Another one got stuck uh, in the mud, they couldn't get it out, so that was two out. They had another one that uh, two of them ran into each other on the ground, taxiing at nighttime. So there were two of them out. So we ended up with six airplanes going to the target. <laughs> but that uh, that was a flight that extended too much from. It was a poorly, in my estimation. Poorly planned flight, flying from Townsville, Australia, clear to Rabaul, mm. and back to Port Moresby. Well, on the way up, we ran into a horrific thunderstorm. We couldn't get over it. We were up at 27,000 feet. Still couldn't get over it. And the, the, the six airplanes dispersed and everything, you know. So, except my airplane and my pilot kept close in with one of the other pilots and uh, he got the hell for that because it was possible we could have had an air, air collision, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but we stayed with one pretty, pretty close, you know. But by the time we Dispersion flyer. When we got to the target, our our fuel supply was so limited we could go over and come back and fl and uh, hit the airdrome or anything. So the decision was made to bomb the shipping in the harbor, which we did, and uh, we turned around, and headed back to Port Moresby because our fuel supply was gone. Had we circled around going north and coming down from the north side, we'd have, we would never have made it back. So it was all calculated. We, it took more fuel than we expected, you know. So anyhow, on the way back, uh, squadron commander by the name of Major Carmichael, he became famous later on. Anyhow, his, his ships had been hit uh, in the oil tank on the right wing, uh, number two engine, or three engine, number three engine. And so it was spewing oil over the place. And so our pilot decided to throttle back, stay with him in case he had to ditch or anything. We would know where he was at and everything. But we did get back by the skin of our teeth, back to Port Moresby, all of us. But one of the flights landed, had to ditch in the jungle. It became known as the, uh, uh, Swamp Goose, Swamp Ghost. I don't know if you've ever read about that. I haven't. No. That's a big story oh. by itself. I'm gonna write it down. Anyhow. So did you guys encounter any um, any enemy fighters or? They were up there, and we had aircraft fire and fighter what's we got, but we got little we got little attacking, but uh, I was in the tail gun position. And one of the uh, fighter planes, after everybody thought that we were beyond the scope of the fighter, which we got, 
Well, I was in the tail gunner pit, and here's one, one guy. It was an older airplane, older Japanese fighter plane with fixed landing gear. He was trying to get up to our altitude because after we dropped our bombs, we could get a little higher. So he was trying to get up, and he would dive down, and he would get up and shake. I could watch him out there, you know. So he was a little bit too far away for me to watch because. But I thought, maybe I should just spray the whole area, you know, with, with the gallery. He'd run into it, you know. But I, I couldn't contact my pilot, you know, see what he, he would give me the okay because our communication was out and I was there by myself. I didn't have anything. But anyhow, the two side gunners decided to sit down. They no longer able. So I had to take ammunition and empty shells and throw up there to try to get their attention because there's still airplanes out there, sure. you know. So, so that was my experience on that flight. <laughs> they kind of took a break. Because, boy, you, that's a lonesome spot in a tail gunner's position when you have no communications with right. anybody. I bet. So anyhow, we were able to get back, get out of that thing. Mm -hmm. That was just... That was most memorable. Your first one. Yeah, first one. That was the first defensive, uh, or first offensive mission against the Japanese at that time mm -hmm. we flew. And you mentioned a lot of the other ones were recon missions. Uh, <clears throat> we were, we would go maybe three, four, sometimes five bases mm -hmm. to go over and uh, do reconnaissance. And uh, we, we weren't looking for anybody to, to come in contact with. We were trying to stay out of harm's way, you know, as much as possible. Our mission was to take, take pictures and everything of facilities and things like that. So we stayed out of harm's way for most of the time. We, we, we'd get attacked by some fighters sometimes and some Japanese warships, they would throw uh, anti-aircraft fire up there. Japanese cruisers especially were very, very accurate, you know. But fortunately, we escaped a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, enemy action that way. Mm -hmm. so, uh, did see them taken off from aerodromes and getting up. We would stay out. In fact, uh, I remember one time we had a brand new navigator with us, and uh, we were over Ley, as in the northern part of New Guinea, and these fighters were coming off the runway, and the runway extended into the ocean. And at the end of it, so they were coming down, and uh, I saw at that thing one of these fighter planes come off, and he didn't quite make any crash into the ocean, but uh, they were uh, shooting a lot of anti-aircraft fire at us. So this navigator came, he said, say, I think they're signaling us down there. I said, you just wait a minute till he gets up here. <laughs> he thought they were signaling till she see the fire, you know, so. <laughs> so he learned real quick that was in the back. So. So were there any other any other memorable missions or close calls or anything? Well, uh, yeah, we were we were there's so many of them. We were just going all the time. See, yeah. it seems like, but uh, we were selected. Our crew was selected along with one other, uh, headed by the the crew uh, commander was Major Bostrom, and. Uh, we were uh, uh, dispersed down to uh, Cloncurry, Australia, I believe it was, or Charter Towers, I'm not real sure. I think it was Cloncurry, Australia, because the Japanese are right off the northern coast of uh, Australia. But anyhow, our mission was to go into the Philippines and bring General MacArthur out. So anyhow, there was just two airplanes, but somebody 
told me later on that there was a third, but I never knew about that or never saw it or anything. It was just the two of it. Well, we were lined up to take off the the uh, quarter, the, the lead man, Major Boster, started to take off and he blew a tire on his airplane. So he aborted the takeoff, came back, told our crew to stay down and take care, change the tire on his airplane. So I never got into the Philippines on that mission. But Bosser brought General MacArthur out, see. So anyhow, we had to stay there. No tool, no nothing. We had to go to the railroad to get a jack to jack the airplane up. <laughs> but that was one notable mission that I was on. Sure. And then another time, the uh, Japanese land forces were up on the north coast of New Guinea and they had to send reinforcements up. So we lighted, uh, we had to fill the airplanes up with as many infantrymen that we could get into the airplane and be able to take off. So we had about 25 of them in there, all geared up. So we got them in there and hauled, hauled them up to Port Moresby and they took off from there. And then another time, we were coming back from uh, Port Moresby. We were going to take all the cooks and bakers out of uh, Port Moresby back to Australia to give them a few days of ours, recreation, you know. So we had a whole bunch of bakers and cooks aboard our airplane. Well, on the way back, they got lost. They, uh, and they didn't set their altimeter so they had what we called an eldest lamp. It was a signal lamp, you know, for it. So they were flying down close to the water with this eldest lamp to see just how far close to the water they could get so they could set their out terminator see, at nighttime <laughs> with all these cooks and bakers. So the only people that had parachutes was the crew members. We had all these cook and bakers, so what do you do, you know? Thank goodness they were able to get it. And we got in late that night and everything. And I remember I just got into my bunk and they come to me, shook me up, said, we want you to be an engineer on a B-24 and it has to go out and search for somebody. And I said, yeah, I'm not even checked out on a B-24, no way, you know? So. They decided not to take me. <laughs> so there's a few instances. Okay. Um, so when did when did you um, did you serve the duration of the war? Or well, did you I stayed there. Stateside? I stayed there in uh, flying reconnaissance combat missions for till November, and so they selected uh, some. Uh, some of our crews to go back to the States. So the, used as a cadre for training. They were building these air bases all over the country. And uh, so my crew was one selected to go back. So we came up through the island chain back to Hawaii. And then he uh, sent us on a, an air transport airplane back to the States. And what and year from was there, this? That's a Travis, they sent us into Travis Air Base. And there from there, they put us on a train to Pocatello, Idaho in the middle of winter, from summer to winter. All I had was those khaki shorts, shirts, and everything. What year was this? That was uh, in uh, 1943. 43. 40, oh, excuse me. It was November 42. Okay. The last, last part of November. So they sent us up to Pocatello, Idaho. And they just kept us in the barracks there with, I had the only way we could keep warm was get in bed and put a blanket over it. The Red Cross was going to furnish us all this stuff and everything and never came about. So, so they did uh, give us some warm clothing up there, give us another outfit. And then they put us on a troop train 
sentenced down to uh, the Rattlesnake Air Base in Odessa, Texas. <laughs> and there uh, we formed the 19th Bomb Group, got us all put back together again down there. And so they selected, in the meantime I had made Tech Sergeant. And uh, so they uh, selected our crew and another crew, and they, uh, those with Tech Sergeant ratings and, and an air mechanic ratings, they wanted to uh, have us uh, go before the Board of Officers to be commissioned. So I happened to be one of those. And so I went before the Board of Officers and they sent my stuff in to Washington and everything to get commissioned. And it all came back as disapproved because they said I was underweight. Well, found out that the hospital made a mistake instead of a hundred and 15 pounds I weighed, they said I weighed 105 pounds, or 125 pounds, I don't know what to weigh, but, but so they knew they made a mistake, so I had to go through the Board of Officers again, and they sent it all in, and I was the first one to get back, made a second lieutenant. <laughs> But your time overseas was done at this point. Yeah. You had flown your 55 that, that missions. Was, and that, that was, of course I had to go back over again a couple of times, but anyhow. But, uh, when did you have to go back over? Right after the war, they sent me to back to overseas, okay. to the Philippines. Okay. Um, so how, how, how good did it feel, or how happy were you to be sent back to the, to the States? You're done, you know, you're done flying uh, combat missions. You know, uh, at that time, we didn't even know what they were sending us back for, to tell you the truth. They knew they were sending us back, but they didn't tell us why or anything like that. It wasn't until we got to Hawaii till we found out that we were going back to this. I thought we were going back to Hawaii and then maybe back down again. See? Yeah. I didn't get to Hawaii before I knew that we were going back to the States and form these cadres, you know. Well, were, you, were you happy to be? I was happy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a hero. I was a survivor. That's yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> well, that's one of my one of my questions. How do you how do you respond when people call you a hero? I I I was not a hero. I just I was just lucky to be a survivor in all that at that time. We lost we lost. Uh, one whole crew that was close to, I knew most of them real closely, and they, they, they never came back. They just went out. So, you know, it, it stuck with me for a while, you know, so it made an impression on me. Yeah. But we had other people that were shot, injured, and everything like that, but not a whole crew. Did you lose any, any close friends? Any what? Did you lose any close friends? Uh, 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 there were three members of that one crew that we lost and everything I, I was very close to. So, yeah, I lost three of those. In fact, I, I was rooming with one of them, the radio operator, when I went on an R&R &R one time to Rock, Rockhampton, Australia. They sent us in there for a couple of I have to go get the dog. So let me ask you, where were you when the war had ended? When the when the war was over. Oh, when I was I was in Dyersburg, Tennessee, mm -hmm. at air base there. Mm -hmm. Once I got commissioned, they sent me to Dyersburg, Tennessee, as an aircraft. At that time, it was called engineering officer, mm -hmm. but it was a squadron, became squadron maintenance officer, aircraft maintenance. And I had, uh, at, at the beginning of that, 
period, I had somewhere in about 115 mechanics working for me. Mechanics and uh, supply people, the whole makeup of a, a squadron. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there uh, for about let me see, I went to about uh, a year, I think, maybe less. But then they sent me to uh, take over the sub depot. Uh, at that time, each of the bases had a sub depot from Wright Pat Air Base, you know, to do major maintenance. Well, they weren't doing the job. We had 17 major. Uh, repaired the aircraft that needed repair and it was impinging on the uh, flight or the uh, training operation there so the group commander came to me and he says Earl he says I send you down there and if you can I was the first lieutenant at that time uh, if you get those airplanes out of there by June he says I'll make you a captain I said Sounds fine to me. So they sent me down, and I had to take over this sub depot. There were 326 civilians, and so I was able to take about a dozen airmen, top airmen, with me to to take over this sub depot. So that was a big learning curve in in management for me. So. I was only about 23 years old, so, so yeah. Uh, and then the the rest of your military career, you spent a total of 30 years. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you stayed with with what would become the. the okay, Air you Force. want to give me give you a little coverage of everything I did in those yeah, 30 years? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, stayed there for a. We got all those airplanes. I made captain before June of that year, see. So I got all these uh, aircraft out. In fact, I had uh, down to one airplane. I had a one that, uh, to give you a little story, one that had the nose knocked off of it was uh, in flight collision with a, uh, a gunnery training mission. And uh, I had one with uh, tail knocked off of it. So the one with the nose knocked off, well, we, I had one before and I went to the Boeing company and asked them for, that was called a station one to three, asked them if they would take a, a, that station and send it to us to put on this one aircraft. And they did, they sent that down. So I had this other one. So I went to them again to get that same section. They said, no, you can't. We can't interrupt the line anymore. So I had my sheet metal people make a false nose on this airplane with sheet metal and fly it in the right pat and tell them to fix it. They sent it back and said, no, scrap the airplane. So, so to make a long story short, I took the, the one with the nose missing and the one with the tail missing and I made one airplane out of them and I got all seven. <laughs> All of them out of there. So <laughs> then they made they set me up and became production control chief for the and Then they closed the base. The war was over, yeah. so they started to close the base. We had somewhere on the base at that time uh, maybe fifty. Brand new B seventeen is on base mm -hmm. there. So anyhow, the war is over to do anything with them. So <laughs> so anyhow, we closed the base, and they sent me to Gulfport, Mississippi, and I stayed down there until I helped them close that base. And then they made me commander of a sea rescue unit in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Way out there, I had my own uh, mess hall, everything. I had fire boats. One of the biggest boats I had was a 130 foot uh, big boat. I had, 
I used to remember how many boats I had. I had all different kinds, 65, 64 footers, 85 footers, fire boats, everything. So they stepped, kept me there as a commander of that unit until they uh, sent me off to B-25 maintenance officer school. And after I finished the B-25 maintenance officer school at Chinook Field, Illinois, they sent me to McNeil Field, Florida and put me in a squadron O. That was over, uh, squadron, they over the number that the Air Force didn't need anymore. And there must have been four or five hundred officers in this squadron O. But there were only two of us in there that had a 4823 MOS, so maintenance officer. So anyhow, they were discharging flying officers by the dozens down there at that time. But they called me up to personnel and wanted to make me a commanding officer of the aerodrome squadron, which was to take care and cut the grass and take care of the, everything like that. I told him, I said, well, no, I, I'd rather not do that because I'm an aircraft maintenance officer and I, I don't want to do that. They said, well, if you don't take this thing, we'll send you overseas right away. I said, oh, I'll take that chance, you know. So I went back to Squadron O. And the other maintenance officer, they called him up. And I told him, I said, you tell him the same thing as I told him up there. So you want to take that over. He went up, they told him, said, well, the last officer was in here, said he didn't want it, but you've got it. We don't want any excuses. So he had to take the squadron over there. So, yeah. <laughs> but they sent me overseas right away. <laughs> they put me on a troop train, sent me to North Carolina and on a troop train and back on a 21 day uh, vessel, uh, army transport to the Philippines. <laughs> and I be got one of the best jobs I ever had in the Air Force down there. They made me the uh, aircraft distribution officer. And uh, that was to, uh, to locate certain airplanes and uh, dispose of them in the proper legal way and everything. And so they decided to move the, uh, it was called, uh, uh, forget the name of it, but anyhow, they sent, a, sent us up to Japan and we occupied a, a complex of buildings where the Japanese were trying to make synthetic oil during the war. So we went up, we t they tore out all the equipment and everything like that and made our headquarters there, Far East Air Materiel Command. And so uh, they decided that what my job was with taking care of aircraft that I belonged in supply rather than maintenance. So they put me in supply and made me accountable officer for 5,536 aircraft to find out where they were in the theater. I had storage pools in Guam, Okinawa, J Japan, o uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, every place in the Pacific, and Manila, which was the biggest one. It's a lot of planes. And so, and then they had a boat converted to an oil tanker, uh, from an oil tanker t with a flight deck. And it was under my directional control to ship aircraft from one point to the other point, you know, that needed to fill up squadrons and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it took me three years. And I worked with the State Department to, called the Foreign Liquidation Commission. And any we had to go out and classify all the aircraft in these storage pools. 
as fair, good, or bad, you know, what a condition of it was. Aircraft that were, had any commercial values, C 47s, uh, L 4s, L 5s, C 46s. Anyhow, we would uh, evaluate those airplanes, and those we would declare to the Foreign Liquidation Commission, they would sell them. To give you an idea, if we had a C-47 that was in good condition, we would give an okay for it. They would sell it for $10,000, period. And little L, crated L-4s and L-5s, little, that's a Cub, uh, Piper Cub, but the bigger one. Mm -hmm. They would sell for a thousand bucks on spot. Who are they selling them to? Uh, the, mostly the Chinese were buying them. In fact, they they had a at one point they had a uh, a go between for them. He wasn't Chinese. He was an American negotiating for the sale of 400 C-46s. So they sold them for those 400 C-46s to this man. But it was the Chinese government. The Chinese government bought all those. The Chinese government bought a, bought a whole B-25 depot down in Paco Biak for one million dollars. That was the whole depot plus uh, all the B-25s that they had there. We had to demilitarize the, the aircraft, the B-25s. We took all the propellers off of them and shipped them back to the States. But somehow they got the propellers back. Somehow. Separate transaction. Then I had a PBY that lost an engine down on one of the lower Philippine islands. And so we sent an engine crew down there to change the engine on the thing. And they called back to our headquarters and said the airplane's ready to send the crew down to pick it up. It was already to test fly it and bring it up. And foreign language condition says, sell it on the spot for 1000 bucks. <laughs> so those are some of the outstanding things that we had to deal with. Yeah. But we, uh, we had to find Planes that were shot down during the war, we had to find it, try to certify it. Uh, those that were damaged, those were crashed, all that. So it took me three years to do that. But in the meantime, I had my wife. She came over and they gave me a brand new home on Tachikawa with five servants free if I feed them. So I could only feed two of them. So anyhow, it was. Very nice assignment. So anyhow, so Sounds like it. but it was it took a lot of time to to do that. Mm -hmm. But that that's just one phase. Yeah. Um, so after you got out of the military, you came back to California. Uh, yes, after I retired. Mm -hmm. Yes, I uh, had my choice to go any place. I came back to Richmond. My daughter went through all the schools here and everything, because I had two assignments. The headquarters 15th Air Force, it was based out here at March. Mm -hmm. I was in headquarters then. Okay. But when I uh, came uh, back from the uh, Japan, I sp spent three years in uh, Fuchu, Japan there at that time, uh, just outside of uh, of uh, Tokyo. That's another little episode I could tell you about. President Truman had declared we had to have a 55 group program. Are you interested in all this stuff here? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> he declared that we had to have, have a 55 group program at the war. So my job was to outfit a P-47 group down in Guam with 75 P-47s. And uh, so anyhow, on uh, close to Christmas Eve of 44? Yeah. No, 45. 
So it was after after the war, it would have been. Hey, after the war, it's 40, 45. Christmas, 45. I went up to headquarters the thief, the thief call him, or thief. That's the Far East Air, the Far East Air Forces. And uh, told them that we had just got that they're all combat ready. Mm -hmm. They're ready to go, 75 of them. They got a message in that says, President Truman said, we don't need 55 group program, cut them back. So they said, you tell, let the people there in Guam know that as soon as they can get rid of their aircraft, they can rotate back to the States. Told them that they went up and dumped 75 com combat ready P 47 fighter aircraft into the Pacific Ocean. They all wanted to These get are out. little stories, they come out. They, there's a cliff up there, they take them on a cliff and dump them over the cliff. So. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of planes sitting at the bottom. There's there. a big pile of them down there someplace. But anyhow, I uh, uh, <laughs> I came back to the States and they assigned me to Castle Air Force Base, California. I was up there for five years. <clears throat> so did you... Did Became you, you, squadron commander up there for a maintenance squadron. Okay. Did you get a, a civilian job after you, you no. got out of the... No. So once you retired, you, I, you enjoyed I, I came back and I went to to finish my education in, in the University of California here at Riverside. So, well, I in the meantime, while I was in the service, I I went to two uh, two year colleges and one in uh, Modesto, California, one down here in Riverside. Then graduated from uh, UC here at Riverside. Then I got into politics, mm -hmm. and so I, I campaigned and ran. Do you want to know this part too? Yeah, I'd love to hear. It. Ran uh, campaign for uh, President Nixon, for President uh, uh, Reagan, for uh, part of uh, Bush campaign. The first. Here in Riverside. In fact, I was uh, during the Reagan thing. I was running a, a phone bank, and they wanted me to run. The, they came down and said the best in California. They wanted me to go around the California to set up phone banks. And I, my wife said, "No way. You're not going to go out and run around all over the place doing that." And I thought, "No way." So anyhow, they did. I was instrumental in bringing Nancy Reagan down to into Riverside. To view my phone bank at that time. So, anyhow, they indicated to me they wanted me to run for state legislature, and I said no. My wife didn't want to. too many, too, too far away, you know. So, I, I said so. Anyhow, uh, I left. Uh, well, I was went to. Uh, well, that's in still in the service, so I'm outside of the service. But I spent three years in Madrid, Spain, too, in the meantime, so. Traveled um, the world like you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I was in Haycourt 7th Air Force. 7th Air? No. 10th Air Force. That's the headquarters there. And uh, that's the same thing. I had a beautiful, beautiful assignment over there. But that's when I decided I, I had enough of aircraft maintenance, so I wanted missile maintenance. So they sent me to Rapid City, South Dakota, and I became chief of maintenance for the Titan II system. Mm -hmm. They sent me down to headquarters 15th Air Force, and I became branch chief for all missiles in the west coast of the United States. That's that. Atlas D, E, and F, Minuteman, Titan One and Two. So I had that. So. I made full colonel, and they sent me down to Tucson. I became squadron commander of the 390th Strategic Missiles Squadron down there. And then I made deputy commander for maintenance, and then vice commander of the 390th Strategic Missile Wing down there when I retired. But anyhow, they, that's military. So when I got out, I was telling you about my politics. I ran for office here, and I won the 
won this seat on the Riverside, what we call it, and found out that all I had to do was try to get people to contribute to the party. So I did. I, I didn't want to do that. So that I didn't run again. They wanted me to, but I didn't. So anyhow, my wife took ill, and she after forty six years, and she passed away. She got cancer, and so I spent about five, four or five years bacheloring around here, and I met my present wife, and. Uh, she was in business, she had hair salons here in Riverside. So I met her and I went in the business with her, became the accountant for her businesses, and we got married. <laughs> How long have you guys been, been married? 24 for? years this September. Uh, but anyhow, I was in that, found out that that had a lot of real bad aspects to it, trying to keep people, trying to hire people, qualified people and everything. So after a good many years, we decided to sell it. We found a buyer, we sold it, and we've been traveling ever since. Awesome. Till we're getting sold, we, we got one more trip to make here. We didn't, don't know whether we're going to be able to make it or not. So. Where are you going? Up to Aspen. We go up to Aspen and, well, we travel all over. We've been to, we've been to, to Russia, Norway, Sweden, uh, Greek, Turkey, Libya, went down to Libya, uh, England. Where else did I go? You've seen it this all. This is all over. Down the Caribbean a couple of times. Alaska about four times. <laughs> Three times. Three times. One of them was uh, went up on a on a uh, cruise. Uh, no, it was a, it was called the Alaskan Ferry. Okay. They hauled supplies up, so we went up on that Alaskan Ferry. It was, it was just a just a ferry boat. Mm -hmm. so then the other three times we d went up there and drove all around Alaska. Then the last time we took uh, well, we took a cruise up one time. Then this last time we went up on another cruise and decided that was so bad we're not going to do it again. So we went on, a, I won't name the cruise line, but I'll never go <laughs> on it again. So. <laughs> well, let me ask you if there's any advice that you could offer to my generation or future generations, yeah. what would that be? Well, I tell you what, I I loved the service and everything, and I thought, you know, coming from being just somebody from a small town like I did and everything, and the armed services gave me the opportunity that it did and everything. Young people, if they have any inclination towards that, they should do that. It's a wonderful career and everything, and there's a lot of great benefits from it. It's not only travel. It's a steady, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, being out of a job or anything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Although, during, during the down part of the, my career, there were days when they didn't know whether they were going to knock out people or not, you know. But anyhow, but aside from that, it opportunities to, to, to do great things, no matter what you do. So, uh, it's... It's great, and also I found out that you, you had to sort of look ahead all the time as to what you want to do in life, you know. After I got out, I debated on what what I should do and like that, and, and I had an inclination towards politics because my father was, a, was, a, uh, was a, in politics. And I learned a lot from him and everything like that. And I enjoy it even today. I still am. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, just keep your eye open to for, for opportunities. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with me. And yeah. thank you for your I service. I hope you could 
take some of that out. I don't know whether it was of interest to you or not. It was all, all of interest. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, it, it was a great time for me. I hated to get out, but I knew that uh, I was a non-flying officer. And I was up against a lot of flying officers. And being in a vice commander's position in the wing, my chances of going any further were pretty, it was, I don't think they would, it was always finding flying officers to take the top positions and everything. So, so I had an opportunity, I got out and Enjoy the I'm rest happy. of your life. I, I've been busy all my life here, you know, doing things, so all sorts of things. So I think not only travel, but building things and doing this, going here, doing that. So I, I, I've had a very charmed life. Well, thank you for sharing it. With I've me. got, I've got uh, only one daughter, one granddaughter. Mm -hmm. My daughter married a, eventually became a colonel. He passed away in 2013. She lives in uh, Illinois. My granddaughter was married, and that marriage came apart. But she worked. Both of them had graduated from from uh, college. She had a. He became an engineer for and a top engineer and. and and uh, a senior in the uh, Toyota uh, headquarters in Cincinnati. My granddaughter uh, worked for, uh, she, actually she graduated, she got a master's degree in, in uh, well, I can't think of anybody, but uh, taking care of, uh, grants from the government and everything, urban development. So she went to work as a, and you don't uh, see this very often, she came out and became a county uh, administrator for Clark County, Kentucky. She was just right out of college. But then while she was a administrator for Clark County, Kentucky, a lady came in about getting an environmental study on a project. And she saw my granddaughter and said, would you come to work for me instead? So she went for work for him. Then she became uh, a political appointee to the governor of Kentucky. They sent her down to, she became a political appointment to the Governor of Louisiana made her the uh, disaster control chief for the state of Louisiana for Katrina, dispersing billions of dollars. She was there eight years. The chief right of, chief of staff for uh, the governor of Louisiana decided to go in the business himself in the same thing, disaster, con per dis disaster cleanup, I forget, but, but anyhow. So he went to New York, started his company, took my granddaughter with him. Just She just made senior vice president of the company, and now they got her traveling all over the place, so she's doing very well. Good for her. <laughs> But she's still single. <laughs> so I only had two, a, a daughter and a granddaughter. So, uh, so that's, that's a shame. I'd like to have had a couple more out there someplace, but that's it. But my daughter was the only child, and she was the only child. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much.